Um, yeah, so thank you very much for joining us and we really appreciate you joining us um, on Sunday so consistently and we know two hours from your day earlier weekend this is a lot uh, so thank you very much for joining us we appreciate that once again happy Mother's Day to all mothers uh, whether it is a Mother's Day it's officially in your country or not <laughs> we want to celebrate Mother's Day the same point of uh, astutely uh, every day so thank you very much and uh, today uh, so I wanted to also thank um, Michael Di Bernardi, uh, my friend uh, who is co uh, facilitating these workshops with me so thank you Michael thank you Maurice great to be here again and as Mario said, happy Mother's Day to everyone. We're excited about this workshop and I, I won't spoil too much of it, but it's gonna be a little different today in that a little less lecture and more uh, kind of activities, um, meditations, uh, awareness and imagery exercises. So we're excited to do something a little bit different today. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and Alexandra, thank you for also uh, being with us and particularly Tomorrow, when we do our uh, webinar in Polish, we are going to be more in the role of Michael. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much. Happy to observe today. Thank you. And happy Mother's Day to everyone who celebrated today. And thank you, AJ, Dr. Jancic, for, uh, for uh, really making sure that, that the technology works, but also providing the the reminders and keeping us on track and so that is really appreciated you know so uh happy be, i'm super happy to be working together with all of you guys so thank you so then particularly thank you for again once again this is particularly for our participants and without you this wouldn't be making any sense but we also noticed that we have much more viewers on youtube than we have uh, live so so thank you so and today is very special the subject of imagery is very special because um, two of my mentors and friends uh, Simon um, uh, Carl Simonton and uh, Maxi Mosby introduced to their work the application of imagery at the same time in 1971 but independently, <laughs> they didn't know each other. They met in, in 1985, but it was, um, and we will merge uh, in our workshop today, uh, those two traditions, let's say. Um, so Simonton used imagery to stimulate uh, the healing powers of our body, while Maxi Moldsby, and uh, Michael is going to talk more about it, used what he called rational noted imagery. It was to practice healthy way of thinking. And I'm going to start with that um, uh, because we want to re re remind about uh, some of the principles. So yes, we use this uh, pandemic as a, as a motivating factor for us to address our emotions because uh, in, the, uh, the tight spaces that we are confined to and in difficult times, our true colors shine through, right? And we can learn a lot about ourselves exactly when we are thrown out of our usual routines. And this pandemic threw us off that usual routine and it gives us a, an opportunity to, wow, I, I can, I can, find a new balance and find new um, harmony at a different place. And with Michael, we were doing uh, workshops, um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, but we use as a metaphor uh, chaos theory. And the, the titles, these were advanced cognitive behavioral therapy uh, workshops and call them uh, from chaos to self-organization. And indeed, in chaos theory, we know that when the system is thrown off the balance, it has also the opportunity to self-organize 
in a more adaptive uh, way on a higher level of organization and uh, in, in, with more harmony within itself as a system and more harmony with bigger systems around it. So, so yeah, so this pandemic we used as a, as a uh, not just an excuse, but also as an opportunity. And so, and we are basing it on, uh, on cognitive behavior therapy, which is, we, and Michael, we, we have on YouTube, on our channel, we have the great explanation of ABCDs of emotions by Michael. You can always uh, review them, but let me go through them really quickly, like in the situation of this pandemic, right? Uh, for a lot of people, uh, there's, there's a pandemic, and for some, and many, actually, it causes fear, right? Because... So they, we, oh, there's a pandemic and then and there's exper experiences of fear. So A is the activating event. And our fear is actually not what we usually think, oh, the pandemic causes fear. No, the pandemic causes us to think about. And fear is a C in A, B, C, Ds. In between A and C are our beliefs, which is what I think about the pandemic, right? And, and that is very crucial because when I experience fear, uh, uh, intense fear or intense anxiety, I will do everything to reduce it, right? So that is the reason that a lot of people may be turning to alcohol or uh, turning to drugs or, uh, or other things to numb these emotions. Right? Because the, the, the pandemic is there. You, know, you wake up every day to it and it does not go away. They come and, and then uh, but, but some other people may say, oh, wow, for me, this pandemic in B is an opportunity, right? I may, yes, if I, that is a serious situation. But in, and I think in B, oh, it gives me opportunity to catch up on things that I couldn't catch up. And in C, I am calm. And in D, I am catching up on my writing or catching up with my uh, friendships through Zoom or catching up on uh, sleep or, or books that I haven't read or uh, binge watching some, uh, some stuff. So then I have very different uh, feelings. And, and some people may be, so that is where I have positive, some people may be neutral, right? Uh, so I say, okay, there's a pandemic, let me take all good measures and uh, and I take those measures, I may be relatively safe, but we are never really truly safe. But, you know, we're, with physical distancing, everything I can, uh, I can be protected. So in C, they have neutral emotions, and then in D, they are acting according to these thoughts and emotions. But I want to come back to those, to those who experience intense fear. Um, Sometimes uh, we're moving into a, a conspiracy theory, maybe a relief, right? Because this pandemic we, and the science admits that, that we don't know everything about this coronavirus, right? We are learning as we go. And the fact that we don't know, um, a lot of people think that, oh, the things that we don't know are creating our fear. Come on, no. <laughs> Fears that we don't, things that, that we don't know don't create our fear. We don't know a lot of stuff, for example, in, uh, let's say, what is the square root of 5,378? You don't know that. But are you disturbed by it? No. <laughs> so things that we don't know don't disturb us things that we insist on knowing, but there is no way for us to know. These things are disturbing us. And Maxim Mosby used to say, hey, uh, we are not afraid of things that we don't know. We are afraid of being proven wrong. That is uh, the greatest fear. And, and so creating a, but people don't like ambiguity and, and uncertainty. So they, Conspiracy theories, they decrease fear by exactly it, by creating some explanation that is easy 
and and then this way may decrease the anxiety and that is so that is because they are getting so much traction because they immediately work on, on decreasing the anxiety right uh, so and then that motivates for people to oh wow my anxiety decreased if i believe that so we are spreading the, this this particular thing so this particular theory so and maxi Mosby really because the b is what creates how we feel Maxi Mosby formulated the rules for healthy thinking and we were presenting on them and that is a very important that b but even if we arrive to a healthy way of thinking we it is new thought it is we are not believing that yet and he developed a method of practicing new way of thinking through rational emotive imagery and it is form of imagination so and michael will tie it in uh, closer to the end of this workshop so so what is imagery <laughs> and here i like really very much what uh, carl simonton used to say that imagery is just thinking, right? And, and Carl Simonton, for Carl Simonton, uh, imagery was a way of increasing hope. So, because he noticed that many of his patients, uh, he was a radiation oncologist, and he, began, he developed this program that could increase the effectiveness of radiation, but decrease uh, its side effects. Uh, and, and he was certain that it's going to be very popular with patients, but no, patients didn't sign up for this, and those who signed up were dropping out. So he said, well, what was the problem? And it was hopeless. So, and, and he didn't find anyone around him. He didn't know Mosby at that time. And he didn't find anybody who could help him address hopelessness. So, and the way he, eventually, he found it in the motivational uh, psychology of business. His wife at that time, uh, Stephanie, uh, was uh, a, a business psychologist. And, and so, and in business, the idea was that you imagine desirable outcomes and more, with more enthusiasm and more precisely imagine desirable outcomes, more of those outcomes are happening. And doing research in business is relatively easy because you just follow the money, right? So, uh, so that was a, a great way for him to see it. And so, so yeah, so he applied it to with his cancer patients, imagining healing. So he distilled the the definition of imagery into a very simple statement. Imagery is simply thinking about the desirable outcome. That is that is imagery, right? So. Really, and but he said, you know what, imagery is everything <laughs> because we cannot stop thinking. We think all the time. We imagine things all the time, and and he emphasized that is the very human part of imagination. So, so imagining. So, it, but if you want to use imagery in healing, in the, so it is. Oh, I need to focus on the desired outcome, right? So that is the basic thing. Uh, thank you, uh, AJ, for reminding this uh, principle. And I would like to see a show of hands of all of everybody who is on, on here. And um, how many of you have ever worried? I worried in the past. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So. If you have ever worried, how does it feel in your body? It feels tense, right? It feels, you feel it in your body. Sometimes you may have a feeling in your chest or, or in your stomach. Your, your stomach is unsettled or your heart sinks when you're frightened and so on. And so this is an example, worry is an example of using imagery in unhealthy way it is imagining all possible undesirable things right so that is so we feel the translation of what we imagine into our bodies right away and all those of you those of you who did the workshop with us last week remember when we did imagery of lemon how many i 
that many of you salivated, that many of you had the taste of a sour taste in your mouths, or your mouths were watering, and some of you got hungry or thirsty. No, me just talking about it gets me thirsty. thirsty. So, uh, so yeah, so, so that is the form of imagery that we all use too, but it is unhealthy. It is opposite of what we want to do. So imagining desire outcomes, and you see, uh, and that is, we were talking about anxiety a little bit, and, um, but you see the basic issue in anxiety is that we are imagining all possible things that may go wrong. By healthy thinking about the future is, to think not about everything that is possible, but what is probable. And that is very important because uh, what is probable um, uh, what is probable is, is very, because possible things, oh yeah, we can, our imaginations are, can come up with a lot of different possibilities. But you see, we are working towards what is desirable. So the desirable things are actually more probable <laughs> than undesirable things, right? Because we want, we, we are putting F and effort for desirable things, right? I, I hope at least. So we uh, So since you've been using your imagination all your life and you are, <laughs> Uh, and it is really the closest to our human nature. And Carl Simonton used to emphasize that, that imagining your own way of getting well in your own way is, is very important because you do you are an expert in using your imagination in your own way. So, and to give it example, give it as an example, I, let me ask you: What did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, oh man, it's, we are in different time zones. So, what was your last meal? Whether it was lunch, breakfast, or dinner. Uh, uh, so, just imagine what you had uh, for that meal that you had most recently, right? Just think about it, right? Don't, don't say anything to anybody yet. All right. So, if you could, AJ, put a first call. So, how have you imagined it? Uh, was it in the form of, and here you please uh, mark all of the reply. Some, some of you may have seen it, some may have tasted it, some may have heard it, some might have smelled it. Uh, some, like me, think of the list of things that I ate. Some had like a holistic experience. They saw people around. They had the, the they they their imagination put them back in place of that uh, uh, experience, and so they not only saw what they ate, but also had the experience of everybody who was around them and um, sounds and what was the context, what else was happening, uh, or some people may have something very different, right? So please let us know, and, and if you had other experience, put it in the chat, please. And we have chat, and when you put the chat, please share it with all panelists and attendees, so everybody can, can see. Okay, we have... I think we have answers already. Let me share it. Yes, please. Five yes, more seconds, just. All right. Oh, yeah. A lot of people saw it. A lot of people experienced the taste of it, hearing it. When you have something crunchy, then it's when you hear it, right? <laughs> Smelling it. Oh! One third of people are bullet people. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, some, oh wow, 23 had holistic experience and I'm uh, wondering, 
three had a different experience. <coughs> so that would be interesting what was it. And I see that someone in the chat put that worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but won't get you anywhere. <laughs> so uh, that is that is a great, uh, yeah, we can use it in our workshops in the future. Um, so, so you see, I mentioned that uh, uh, using images is very human, and so all of us are experts in using this imagination their own way. So, if you are a bullet person, keep on doing that. If you are a person who sees it, keep on using that. Uh, but if you saw that, uh, even though there is a significant number of people who see it, uh, not everybody sees it. So that is the reason that we are not using as much as the term visualization. But we prefer imagery, and it is auditory imagery, uh, other sensory imagery. Uh, so imagery uh, refers to also other senses, not just seeing it. And so you are an expert in using your imagination your own way, and and that is the reason we want you to keep on doing it your own way. Don't try to use it in some someone else's way. And, and let me give you an example of it uh, right away. We had a, a patient, uh, uh, and she was really very sweet, quiet lady. She had ovarian cancer, and and. Uh, gentle retired teacher and she uh, and she and she was very miserable every time she was getting chemotherapy and and, and you know chemotherapy that the form of chemotherapy that she was uh, given it usually is given on the outpatient basis because that's how it goes but she used to have such a terrible pains in her stomach and every time she got chemotherapy she had to be hospitalized and and when we were talking about imagery and how you imagine uh, your uh, healing and your treatments and so on, she imagined her healing and her treatments from cancer as those soldiers uh, marching through her abdomen, which was where she had her uh, uh, metastases, uh, marching through her bowels in those studded boots and uh, they had canisters on their backs written poison they had gas masks on their faces and they would spray this poison wherever they saw cancer and this cancer would start sizzle and and the smoke would go up and and Carl Simonton said wow that is a an interesting imagery uh, you know, but it doesn't seem to be compatible with your nature because I, I perceive you at least as a very gentle, sweet person and kind person. And, and this, this imagery is so violent and, 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 and so harsh. Um, oh, the psychologist in our cancer center told us to imagine like piranhas and all those things and, 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 and our, our or things like that, and uh, and he encouraged her. You know what? If I would encourage you to really rethink it, what would really be compatible with you? And then she said, "All right, let me work on that." And the next morning, because it is, it was in the retreat. So the next morning, she couldn't wait. Uh, and during breakfast, she came to Carl and started talking about how she imagined. So he said, "Okay, I think that would be wonderful if you shared it with everybody in the retreat." So at 9 a.m. starts the retreat and she shares with everybody. Now I threw away the, and she, she was beaming. She was beaming just with the, just thinking about this new imagery. And, and so how she imagined this healing for herself, she, she said, forget about those soldiers studded boots. No, I think of those barefoot maidens and those floating gowns. And those maidens 
just very gentle flow to my belly. And they are holding uh, arms with some healing balm. And whenever they see cancer, they take this balm in their hands and they massage it very gently in that area, gently, gently, it becomes healthy pink and has no cancer in it. And then they flow to, to another part, right? Come on, guys, and, and do the same thing. Everybody in the room, I was sitting next to Carl and I could see everybody in the room had a big smile on their faces because it was, I mean, whenever I recall this, I have a big smile on my face because, and I feel it in my heart how, how well it feels to me too. I, it resonates with me, uh, even though I may not be as gentle by nature as she was. Uh, so, so yeah, so that is very important. We use our imagination our own way, not someone else's way. And, do it what makes sense to us, not to someone else. And uh, if we have time, I may give you another example uh, at the end of the workshop. So, so you see, so since we've been using imagination all our lives, uh, we, uh, we may not notice it because it is, uh, it is like, because it's our nature, right? So it is a habit, and we don't notice our habit. It is our attitude to imagine things a certain way. So today, particularly with angel sessions that Michael is going to do with us, we are going to become more aware of the processes that have been happening. And the use of imagery in healing is actually oldest known, uh, documented the healing practice. You see, how do we know it? You see, the the, the cave dwellers, they painted their caves, right? And they didn't paint the caves because uh, mom of the cave would say, hey, to her, to her, to the father of the cave would say, hey, did you see our neighbor's cave painting? Huh? Could, you do, could you do something with our cave? You know? uh, and uh, no, they, they were not using those paintings for, uh, for aesthetic reasons. They used their paintings for really to drive their imagination in a desirable way, right? Because they didn't have written language, but they noticed that if they think in a certain way, that they feel better and actually their actions are more effective. So, so they, they were painting important things. They were painting, hunting and gathering food and so on. And, and these also were sustaining them, for example, through winter, right? When they, when the food was not as abundant. So that is important that, for example, right now when we are in this pandemic, it is important that we use our imagination to nurture us, not to scare us, but to see what, what we can do uh, right now that will be uh, nurturing to us. So. And Michael, would you like to add something to it here? Or let me say something too before. So. 40,000 years ago, they were painting, not just how to get the food, but also how to heal. So, uh, so healing practices were painted all those walls too. So that is how we know that the, the imagery is the oldest, uh, all this healing practice that was documented on those uh, uh, caves. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Mariusz. Um, yeah, imagery is very old. Uh, AJ asked me to mention, you know, older technologies that people use. They used uh, entheogenic plants, hallucinogenic plants, which created images, which created visions of how things could be and how things could be different, perhaps how things really are. So we've used the power of the mind, whether to external substances or our own internal, our own internal abilities um, forever as, as, a, uh, as a people, as a as species. Um, may, I, may, may I jump in here because this is also part of our nature. So why those entheogens work with us is also because we have receptors for them, right? So, um, so we know that we have endorphins, so internal morphins. We have endocannabinoids, so internal cannabis or marijuana. We have, so we, our brains can create those things 
even without external substances, but sometimes external substances were out there. Yeah, this will be a whole special topic we'll do some point in the future. But, uh, but, but before we, we move too much into that, I want to add one thing about imagery that I find very useful, both in my practice and in my personal life, and that is that imagery is an opportunity to practice. It's an opportunity to practice a situation, a scenario, maybe, we may talk about this later on, using the RSA, the ABCs, once you've identified a healthier version of the ABCs, a perfect opportunity to close your eyes, do some imagery practice, and, and practice the new behaviors, practice the new thoughts that are going to lead to the new feelings, that are going to need to lead to the new behaviors. So I don't know how many of you have watched the the Michael Jordan documentary, Last Dance. It's on Netflix in Europe, I believe. Um, ESPN here, very fascinating um, about uh, about the time in the 90s. And I know it was an international thing, so hopefully I'm not turning too many of you off with this. Um, it was uh, just an incredible run, six championships by this team. I happened to be living in Chicago throughout that period and um, was utterly fascinated. And everybody in the city that had captured their imagination, people who weren't even sports fans were watching every single game. And um, it was so exciting. But one thing stuck with me that I always remembered, uh, seeing a newscast, I think it was after the fourth championship um, out of six, and they were interviewing Michael Jordan and said, how can you still get up to practice every day? You're clearly the best player that's ever lived. Um, what motivates you? How can you get out there and stay after hours? Um, and he said, well, yeah, the practice is important to me because it helps me connect with my teammates and we, we figure things out, work out processes together. But the most useful thing for me is the practice I do at night. And that's every night while I'm in bed, before I go to sleep, I practice scenarios in my head. So I'm sitting there thinking, there's three seconds left. We're down by one point. Scotty Pippen's over here. Horace Grant is over here. I'm going to throw the ball here. I'm going to run there. He said, playing those scenarios out in my head prepares me for those. So by the time I'm in a game, if I'm in a situation, I've probably already lived that once before in my imagination. So, so it's providing you with prior experiences. So when you get into what seems to be a novel experience, if you've rehearsed the healthy thinking, healthy emotion in advance, you may be able to access that more readily to solve a problem in a current situation. So imagery is very powerful. It's not simply wasting your time daydreaming, fantasizing. It is helping you picture that desired outcome and align yourself with it. So I just wanted to add that in. Um, so thank you very much, Michael, because it is very important. Uh, because our brain and our body cannot tell the difference if the situation is just imagined or actually uh, exercised physically. And there were uh, a, a recent uh, uh, functional MRI tests done that, uh, that, that indeed that the same areas of the brain are activated when we are engaging in a particular behavior uh, or we just imagine it. And so again, it ties in with, the, with Maxi Mosby who used imagery with athletes and he did it in 1969. He had a special grant to do so. So, so yeah, so that was, and he himself was a, a great athlete. He was a football player, American football player. Real football. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so I mentioned at the top that we were going to do a few things a little differently today. Um, and, I'm, and we're going to do an exercise here in a few minutes. Uh, but getting back to the buffalo example the buffalo on the cage the scenes of the hunters bows and arrows shooting at, at the buffalo um yes they were trying to create that eventuality and i would expect that the reason they would be doing this is a speculation on my part but if you're putting a lot of energy into visualizing something it's usually something that you don't have so i believe that perhaps those persons were trying to somehow think that if they called, if they drew images of the buffalo on their cave walls and drew images of them being able to kill them and get food for the, for the clan, that perhaps it would make that an eventuality, it would make that happen for them. So one way of looking at it is 
that was a response to stress for them. They were stressed out. We're out of meat. What are we going to do? We haven't seen those big things with horns in a long time. Maybe we can somehow, with our imagery, bring them into being. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking here about stress and how to manage stress. Uh, we've talked a lot over the last few weeks around COVID and the stresses that's creating in our lives, in our relationships, um, in our fears, anxiety, all of that. But an important thing to know is that you already have, before you even went to any of these webinars, you already have the strongest tool there is to manage stress in your life. Anybody have any idea what that is? You could just shout it out. Yes, Mario. <laughs> what would that be, Mario? <laughs> that I would let you say. <laughs> it's the breath, okay? It's breathing. Aha, Brian nailed it in the chat there. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, breathing is the quickest way to help ourselves relax, to activate that relaxation response in all of us. And in my, uh, in my spare time as a hobby is self-care, I teach some yoga. So, you know, as I've uh, grown my personal yoga practice and learned more about the importance, I've really seen the value that it has in my life. Um, when I am, find myself in a situation to be able to simply breathe, practice exercises, one of which we'll practice in a few minutes um, to help myself relax. The research, however, bears that out as well. Research shows not any specific model of, of breathing, but just focus breath work, boosts your immune system. It strengthens the respiratory system, which is uh, definitely important for all of us right now, relieves stress, relieves mood imbalances, um, reduces stress hormones, improves our parasympathetic nervous system function. So simply breathing in a focused way has all of these health benefits. Um, maybe the more importantly, most important is what it does for the parasympathetic nervous system, which I'll talk a little bit about. So we've heard about the fight or flight response. Mario's talked a few minutes ago about fear and anxiety. When we're faced with something that is unknown to us or something that we interpret as threatening to us, our body automatically goes into this fight or flight response. Um, the fight or flight side is the sympathetic nervous system. And what happens there is you get increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, stress hormones, the blood goes away from the organs to the muscles. Um, are we ready? Yeah, we're, and uh, yeah, we'll talk, Mari should go into more detail about that in a minute. But, um, we, we are preparing ourselves either to fight that threat or to run away for that threat or there's other options as well. What this leads to over time with, with increased stress, especially if you have trauma thrown into that, you know, it leads to hypervigilance, it leads to chronic anxiety, strong emotional reactivity. So flying off the handle in those uh, situations where we're quarantined with our loved ones. Uh, so if we're in that constant state of stress, we're not functioning as well, and it actually has further negative health benefits, or not, not negative health benefits, uh, uh, challenges to our health system. So the parasympathetic system then is the flip side of that. Parasympathetic system brings our heart rate down, it brings our blood pressure down, sends blood to the organ, and it activates the relaxation response, and it helps us regulate our emotional arousal. So there's always this balance going on in our bodies. This is all part of the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic, which is getting us up to fight, and the, the or rather the sympathetic, then the parasympathetic, which is lowering us down, helping us to relax. So I know that's a lot, but the point is, it's about the power of breath. With just a small amount of focused breathing, you can activate that parasympathetic system and lower the stress, stress, stress threshold at any time. So, um, AJ, would you put up that first, the second poll rather? Okay, this is a simple question. How tense do you feel right now? I'm sure after, 20 minutes of Mariusz, you're, you're relaxed and happy, but maybe think about right before this webcast. How tense were you feeling from scale of one to 10, where one means no tension whatsoever, and 10 is the most tension you've ever experienced? And this could all be about, you know, about COVID, about what we're going through. What's your level of tension right now? So just fill one in, and tension can be defined any way that you define it. So that could be physical tension, emotional tension, psychological tension. 
as Mother's Day tension. Mother's Day tension for sure. So put in your numbers. I don't really have to think too much about it. So let's go with the results now, Andrew, and see what people came up with. Oh, wow. Marius, you're, so, you're such a natural healer. Uh, everybody's feel, <laughs> feeling really calm right here. So, uh, you know, so average somewhere probably around a, a three, 3.2, something like that is where people are at. So, so that's very good. Um, congratulations, everyone, on, on handling your stress through through COVID. Uh, maybe I should be. Maybe you should be teaching me right now. Um, so, so let's take a little uh, experiment here. Let's do a little exercise and let's see if um, if that has any impact on the level of tension you're feeling right now. So I'm going to invite you. This is one of those moments where whatever is comfortable for you. So. Ideally, perhaps you could be lying down um, or just sit back in your chair. If you'd like to close your eyes, if that's comfortable for you, close your eyes. Just take a moment. If you don't want to close your eyes, find a point in front of you, six or eight feet, that you can just focus your gaze on. And start to notice your breath. Notice the breath going in. Notice the breath going out. As you breathe in, take that breath first down into your belly, filling your belly and then letting it flow up into your chest, filling from bottom to top. And on your exhale, empty the opposite way. Let the air come out of your chest through your ribs and finally pulling your navel in toward your spine. Just breathe. So we're going to do something called unequal ratio breathing, Vishamavriti. It's actually been scientifically shown to increase relaxation very quickly. So everybody just exhale your breath, hold it just for a second, and then follow my instructions. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Hold, two, three, Four. Again, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hold, two, three, four. Couple more, inhale, two, three, four, Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hold, two, three, four. Last one, inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, hold, two, three, four, and just breathe naturally. A couple of full breaths naturally. AJ, if you could put the next one up, please. And now slowly open your eyes. And once again, AJ is going to put the poll up for us. And right now, how tense you feel on that same scale, one to 10. Don't think too much about it, just rate. Okay, can we see the results of that? 
Let's, let's give a couple more seconds. They're still coming here. And if anyone wants to put in the chat just some comment on how that feels, how they're feeling now after having done that, I'd like to see what your impression is beyond the rating. Okay. Oh, wow. So went from about what I thought would be about a 3.2 rating to maybe, I don't know, about a 1.9, 1 1.8, 1 something like that. So does anyone have any comments either for the chat or just that they would like to make on what that brief breathing experience was like for them? We can un unmute everyone. Anyone? Calm and peaceful, more so than when we started. Thank you. Great. I yeah, mean, I felt pretty good <laughs> to start with, but now I get so <laughs> relaxed that oh man, I do, do I really have any motivation to continue? <laughs> so nice in the chat, it works great. Oh, thank you, Femke. Um, did the pace matter? Finding it a bit hard to hold, relaxing, yawning, light in the head. Okay, good. Well, the pace. Um, Really, you'll mostly be sleeping. sleepy for sure. This is usually something you'll be doing on your own. So if that's too long of paces of a pace to go, you can certainly shorten it yourself. But the nice thing about that breathing is that it really, as you do more and more of it, you really do expand your lung capacity. You really do expand your respiratory functioning. So you find you can go longer. And and you you I'm sure you notice that the exhale each one was a little bit longer. There's different ways of doing it. You don't have to keep adding on each exhale at the number, but, but the research has shown that even controlled breathing at the same intervals is not as powerful as a longer exhale. So what happened in that is we activated the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, you, we were already pretty activated from, uh, from Mariusz, but um, that really, got everything down. And I'm sure if you were taking your heart rate, if you have your Apple watch on or whatever, you can see right now that your heart rate is lower, um, lower than it was when we started. So, so I just wanted to give you that little experience of breathing. It, 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 the, it, it's connected to imagery, but it's a very focused kind of imagery. Um, you're focusing simply on the breath. And a lot of us have images of what's going on when, that, when they're doing that breathing. I described that, that three-part yogic breathing from the belly up through the chest, in, uh, up into the collarbones, and then emptying back down. Well, that's a visualization for me that I always like to use the picture analogy. Pouring water out, it pours from the top to the middle to the bottom, and filling it up, it fills from bottom to top. So use whatever works for you. But the point is doing the breathing will immediately help you kick into a relaxation response, which can be very useful for improving the effectiveness of our imagery and some of the other things that we're gonna talk about over the course of the, the rest of the webinar. So thanks, Mariusz. Thank you very much, Michael. This is great because we are talking about that, uh, that imagery, use of imagery and healing dates maybe, well, we have documentation about 40,000 years ago. Um, but use of breath about 10,000 years ago, and we have traditions in both traditional Chinese medicine, um, but also Vedic tradition, which eventually became Ayurveda, but initially it was just oral tradition, um, uh, about really use of your breath to organize your life energy, right? And so, so really using the breath to your, to, to direct your vital energy in the desirable direction. So, so this is about 10,000 years ago. And uh, and then- I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, actually to Michael. So I feel there's so much hype around the briefing in the last years and probably, you know, have you heard about the Wim Hof method? Mm -hmm. And the Wim Hof breathing, does it... Uh... He's Dutch, by the way. <laughs> to all Dutch. <laughs> and, uh, 
Then I, I'm curious, do you have thoughts around it? Because it, it follows pretty the same principle that, that the use of briefing is quite different, but have you tried it, Michael? And, uh... I have not tried, I'm very fascinated. For those of you who don't know, Wim Hof is a Dutchman who um, through breathing exercises does all kinds of extreme activities. He's run a marathon above the North Pole with you know nothing but a pair of shorts on. He can submerge himself in ice water for extended periods of time. It's all of this kind of mind over body based in the breathing. Breathing is super powerful. It's the one thing that we've been doing since uh, who knows how far back in the evolutionary chain. And it is the one thing that is there for us and available to us. And that's what I like most about it, that anytime you're in a situation, you can go into the breathing and there are lots of techniques. Within yoga, you know, I know of, of 30 to 40 different ones there are. Wim Hof has his holotropic breath work, Stanislav Grof's model actually induces mm -hmm. altered states of consciousness. So the breath is a very powerful tool. Now, whether you believe it's simply um, providing yourself something to focus on, increasing oxygen uh, availability to us, or from the spiritual traditions, it's bringing in chi, it's bringing in prana, that life force around us, it's bringing it in and intermingling the life force within us. So whatever model you want to subscribe to, it's a super powerful tool that you can use. Yes, thank you very much. This is uh really and to look at this we are using two most basic parts so life is based on uh all mammals <laughs> and also um, uh, um, all vertebrate you know they uh, we live because of we can breathe so the the breath and breath is such a wonderful thing because we call it breath of life right uh, so we connect even in the language it reflects or the last breath right or things like that that this we, we connect this with very deep um, deep uh, sense of life um, and indeed this this breath and our imagery together they are really at the um, um, but this mind-body connection, because you see, uh, when we are not aware of that, we just breathe, keep breathing. It is automatic. The same thing with our imagery, it goes automatically, right? But now when we recognize, hey, I can influence my breath to my benefit. I can influence what I imagine. We are employing the most closest to our nature two functions one function of our lungs and another function of our mind, our brain. And we can do it for our healing. And uh, so, uh, uh, AJ, can you put out this slide, the, the brain and all this, how that works? And so on. Yeah, so, so, and Michael already mentioned the uh, in blue you have autonomic nervous system. Uh, so, this uh, autonomic nervous system is, uh, is again, again, why it is called autonomic? Because it doesn't require any conscious effort. It is autonomous from our will, but at the same time, as we mentioned, that breath is this part of, of, autonomic functions that we can easily consciously can change so i think that is a brilliant way we either were created or evolved it doesn't matter and uh, but uh, how how this plays out in, the, in our bodies that this healing function of mind and body we can influence consciously and those of you who will remember our first webinar we were using breath and we're directing our another basic instinct of our body. Uh, we call it emotional GPS, right? The instinct of moving away from toxic and towards nurturing. So using your breath and feeling, ah, oh, what type of breathing is for me most nat naturing right now? And with Michael, and with Michael's explanation, you can use your mind and imagery. Ah, I can feel it my 
belly first and my chest later when I'm breathing in. And when I'm breathing out, I'm feeling like uh, emptying my lungs first. Now, let me tell you, the air is not getting into your belly, right? So <laughs> that's not how that happens, so don't worry. No air is leaking into your gut. <laughs> it is simply when you're expanding your breath, you are lowering your diaphragm, and that is maybe experiences as the air getting into your belly, but it's not. Um, so, but it's Amari, good to feel it. Pardon? Amari, can I add here, Mario? So, one of the things we've been doing throughout these webinars and the workshops is basically teaching that you that with your mind you can change anything with your beliefs with your attitudes with your thoughts you can change your emotions you can change your experience well the one thing you can't change is the autonomic nervous system by th changing your beliefs what affects the autonomic nervous system is our breath so we found two of the major parts of, of neural functioning that we can impact one through changing our beliefs the other through our breath and what we're going to talk about in a, in a little while is is the third aspect is the body awareness is the messages that our body are sending to us how what are the technology for us to access that and improve that but we'll talk about that in a few more minutes thank you very much Michael so if you could uh, AJ go back to our slide and I think so this autonomic nervous system is very important here uh, I don't know if you can see my my mouse uh, uh, oh, yes. okay. Oh, here, this is not my mouse, but it is AJ. So, can you go to prefrontal cortex first and, uh, and show people? Okay, so that is where our thinking happens, our imagery happens, right? And so, that is the area that when we perceive something from the outside, the B happens in the prefrontal cortex. It is our thinking, assessment, evaluation. We cannot just observe, we immediately evaluate which is the b and a b c d's of emotions right and but our c of emotions is green that is limbic hypothalamic system right which and it is a little bit slower it is the older part of the brain it is not as fast as our, our thinking part of the brain and and that is where uh, and that is also the seat of control of autonomic nervous system uh, that is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight, and parasympathetic is relaxation and calm. Um, but also this same area that controls our emotions, so it controls our autonomous nervous system, it controls our hormonal system, but also it releases those wonderful uh, substances. So people usually think of our brains as a complex electrical connections, right? That is how we usually imagine our brains. While in fact, our brain is the most complex gland in our body, releasing so far that we discovered over 80 substances. And some of those substances are called neuropeptides. And they were discovered by Candice Pert uh, in the early uh, 70s. And, and actually she, she uh, wrote later a book, um, uh, Molecules of Emotions. And those neuropeptides, and, and I already mentioned them, endorphins were the first neuropeptides that were discovered. And uh, let me take a side, sidebar here. And, and I know uh, Michael and, and AJ and Alexander always tell me not to take too, too many side, side uh, tracks, but but that is how my brain works, sorry guys. So we are talking about this, the, 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 the body and the science and the mechanisms behind it. But you see our ancestors who discovered the power of our imagination and the power of our breath, they didn't know all those mechanisms, right? So these mechanisms do work whether you know about them or not. So that you may hear about new theories and so on, but let's rely on those that, is very, that has worked for thousands of years, for millennia, for us humans, and also that is verified by modern science. But we don't need to rely on modern science to verify it, because 
and I know that we are going to be laughing. Oh, they discover those those neuropeptides. Oh, big deal, right? In 100 years from now, they will know so many more healing mechanisms that we don't even, cannot, that we cannot even imagine. But they are working in our bodies all the time, whether we know about them or not. So thank you. So let's go back to the slide. <laughs> Keep on track. Um, that wasn't too bad of a sidetrack. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. I mean, I turned off the chat because otherwise, when I see the chat, I, I, my mind goes with too many directions. So, so neuropeptides, and these are also those endogen. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, endorphins, uh, the endocannabinoids, and other substances. So, I met Candice Pert in uh, in 1990, and we were at the bar in Garmisch-Partenkirchen in Germany. Um, uh, at the bar, actually, and drinking cocktails. And she was explaining to me uh, that, you know, with each emotion, our brain releases a very specific cocktail of neuropeptides and other substances. And this cocktail has a specific effect on our body. On, uh, and in, when we are talking about immunity, so it happens that the immunity against cancer that I work with primarily and Carl Simon used to work and against viruses is very similar. It is mediated by cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. And those immune cells are produced in the bone marrow. They mature in the spleen, lymph nodes and thymus and they have the effect on the periphery. Uh, so and and you see Autonomic nervous system, neuropeptides, and hormones affect all those areas. Not only that, our brain receives immediate um, uh, information or feedback about the state of the immune system through cytokines that are released by immune cells. Um, not wanting to go into too much, but Actually, the cytokines may be creating also the, what is called cytokine storm in people who are uh, sick with COVID-19. Um, so, so yeah, so that, these are really connected to everything that we talk about. And also, um, 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 David Felton discovered also nerve endings of the lymphatic tissue that have direct uh, afferent connections, which is bringing information towards the brain, uh, telling the brain the co condition of the immune system. And David Felton was one of the people who f coined the term psychoneuroimmunology. And he was co-author of the first um, uh, handbook of psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, At that time, it was just one, one volume, eventually grew to more volumes. but. Psychoneuroimmunology, this connection between our psyche, nervous system, and immune system. And of course, we, we believe there are other uh, healing systems beyond just the immune system. We know that we, we cut ourselves multiple times and those things heal without our body, without us noticing anything in particular. So if you could show the prefrontal cortex once again, AJ. So, but everything, Everything else that is happening in our bodies is dependent on what we are doing with our imagination. And second, what we are doing with our breath. So combining those two things is crucial, right? So we can affect everything So through that. As we could see the last week, just imagining lemon, we could introduce, induce autonomic nervous system uh, and if you could put the salivary gland, it is the second from the top little round thing uh, right here. So we could stimulate salivary glands to release saliva. We could have the taste in our mouth of lemon that did not exist, that existed only in our imagination. So, um, so that is a, a great example. Uh, all right, so. Uh, uh, so. And now uh, we will go over a few little video uh, uh, 
videos of showing how our immune system works. And I would ask uh, AJ to play the first video from our page. Uh, and it is when we brush our teeth, for example, uh, thousands of bacteria are released to our bodies and thousands, right? I don't want you to stop brushing your teeth. I'm just wanting to show you. Um, and oh, this is a, a new, it, it is a macrophage, this big cell in the middle. And this big cell, uh, show how this, uh, and these round things are uh, red blood cells. And the little guy over there is a bacterium that causes pneumonia. And you can see uh, how this macrophage, and macrophage means huge ear, right? And, and this macrophage is chasing it because it has chemotaxis. It means that this macrophage can smell this bacterium and eventually swallow it. And if you can see in the tail end of this macrophage, there are a lot of dead bacteria already, right? So you see that, that and after brushing your teeth, you don't see anything unusual happening in your body, right? And, but viruses and cancer cells are really eliminated by another system that is called, and of course, these are the systems that we do know. These are natural uh, killer cells. And can you play that one? About 10 to 15% of all white blood cells are natural killer cells. And here, these natural killer cells here in this, uh, this is a, a an animation, but on our website you can see also from the microscope, not animated. So this is natural killer cell. A natural killer cell used to be called promiscuous cell because it would eliminate all cells that are, didn't look like mine. And here's the virus, um, and the virus is infecting this cell. And what's happening, because virus is really not a life matter, um, but it has a genetic material that, but it cannot reproduce itself. It uses host cells to reproduce itself. And when the, the ma genetic material of the virus is injected into the cell, the cell starts producing uh, proteins that are specific uh, to that cell. And you, you notice those yellow things popping up on the surface? These are new proteins. And for natural killer cell on the left, this means, oh, you are not my cell. It look, you look different. You have some strange proteins. You need to die. And the natural killer cell kills. Uh, the, actually, it induces apoptosis. So, so as self-death, the program self-death that each cell has, it, it is induced by natural killer cell. And here's a cancer cell. And cancer cell has on the surface some cancer uh, markers. And says, oh, wow. Well, you don't look like my healthy self, so you need to be eliminated. Natural killer cell kills this uh, cancer cell. And you know, some people believe that cancer cells, not just they, they multiply, but also they die too little. So nat natural killer cells are helping the uh, cancer cells to die really quickly. And when the natural killer cell, can you stop for a second? Um, and when natural killer cell uh, works, it releases, uh, chemicals that, uh, that tell other natural killer cells to come to that area. And if you could jump to the, uh, to the tumor on that video, uh, it is further down. You don't need this petri dish. If you could jump a little bit further down to the tumor. Forward, a little bit further. Oh, here is we have a tumor, a cancerous tumor, and we can see how natural killer cells call each other and say, hey, we have a feast here. We need to kill all those cancer cells in that tumor. So they penetrate the tumor and kill each cell at a time. One cell at a time. But sometimes I'm telling my patients who sometimes, oh, I take one, one day at a time. But sometimes when things are really difficult, we can take one breath at a time. So don't play this one. This is, you, you guys can go to our website as you can see on top, beat-the-odds.org slash videos. Um, and you can see that. But here, can you play the sound also from this video? Because that is, that is uh, our colleagues from Cambridge, uh, as you know, that this, we thank, oh, by the way, Cambridge University, thank you for, for carrying us. And if you could play this with the audio from the very beginning, it is perfectly narrated. 
looks a serial killer. I hear it. A killer whose primary function is to kill and then kill again. Oh, yeah, I, doesn't, we don't hear it too well. So let me, uh, can you pause it for a second? So unlike previous, uh, uh, previous video, that is not an animation. It is an actual video uh, and cancer cells and, and there are different cells now. It is cytotoxic T cells, um, uh, which we produce billions of them every hour. And, and these cytotoxic T cells, like, um, they are like those amorphous blobs that move through a healthy tissue. Here, you, they are in green. Uh, stop for a second, please. And what you see dark, it is not empty space. It is healthy tissue. So healthy tissue is dark, and those, those blobs move between healthy cells. You know, they are penetrating the healthy tissue and looking for telltale signs of cancer, which has those proteins that are different from our own bodies, right? Can you, follow, can you go further with this video? And here are those uh, cytotoxic T cells in red. And you can see how rapidly can move actually between the healthy cells that we don't see here. And, and, they, and here the blue one is the cancer cell. So you can see how this uh, cytotoxic T cells is attaching itself to the cancer cell and touching it and making sure, oh, you are, a cancer cell. Here it is another take when the cytotoxic T cell is in, is in green. Stop for a second. The cytotoxic T cell is in green and the blue is cancer cell. And you can see those red uh, dots. This is the toxin that the cytotoxic T cell is injecting into a cancer cell and through microtubules. So, and you can see the the circle of microtubules at the end of what may look like a mouth of uh, cytotoxic T cells, but cytotoxic T cells don't have mouths. So, just to let you know. so you can see that this is the end of microtubules and this is the injection of the uh, toxin into the cancer cell. Okay, you can see these toxins inside of a cytotoxic T cell. And here you see a cancer cell in blue surrounded by cytotoxic T cells and these, um, how they are injecting those poison into the cancer cell. And here's another take. Boom, it's happening. So and that is from the University of Cambridge. So thank you very much. Um, and hello to all our Cambridge listeners. And, um, and this is funny because, you see, we uh, usually think of, of their specialized cells as being very, very effective. Can you pause for a second? Because it is, I, I want to spend a little bit more uh, on this one. And so, so, and, so we have cytotoxic T cells, um, natural killer cells, but we have the most common white blood cell is a granulocyte. And we, we are really dismissive of this uh, granulocyte. Everybody has them. We didn't think much of it. Until at this Wake Forest University, they did the research. So they took a Petri dish. It is, a, it is not an animation. It is a real thing. So you can see the Petri dish with a medium um, uh, in which they suspended uh, human cervical cancer cells. These are those bigger round ones, and you can see the yellow arrow, and the big one is over there, and then there's going to be another one in the bottom area. And then eventually you're going to see one on the left. Uh, and, so, and those little guys, are these little dots are granulocytes. Those uh, what they can what they can do. This is the we produce the billions of them every minute, guys. Every minute. So, uh, so here I will. I, so so here you can see how those little guys are taking on those big guys. Actually, I always rooting for a little guy. So, let's see that.
right? And here is you see another. And I like this one on the left. Look at those little guys. Oh, the two of them, but they are ferocious. <laughs> You see, um, so these, this is the power of our immune system, the power of healing. That is what's happening in our bodies all the time. <laughs> all the time, guys. We produce cancer cells all the time and we eliminate cancer cells all the time. Our bodies are attacked by viruses every day and our bodies eliminate those viruses every day. Our bodies are flooded with bacteria whenever we brush our teeth or even we don't brush our teeth. Uh, maybe even more, right? And our bodies eliminate these these cells without us being even aware of anything unusual. So that is that is the power of it. And, and so here I want you, to, I I want to because we are bringing the traditional traditions uh, of use of healing powers of our mind and our breath and our imagination to to uh, to more recent times and the most recent times I'm talking about uh, 2,500 years ago. That is when, uh, oh, let's take it to 2,600 years ago. That is when Buddha lived and he, he said that with our minds, we create the world. And actually that is confirmed by modern science that we don't have access to reality. We imagine reality and we create the world with our imaginations. So we will be talking about it at the end uh, a little bit more about when we're doing the exercise of creating our healing reality of the moment. And about 2,500 years ago, just 100 years after Buddha, not even that, uh, was uh, Hippoc Hippocrates. Hippocrates is considered the father of all medicine, of Western medicine at least, uh, but he has a lot of uh, very forward uh, ideas. And at that time, the ancient Greeks developed a specific way of use of imagination. Because you see, they didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have the very advanced surgery, they didn't have all the medications that we have, but they didn't know as much, but they, what they did, they listened to their patients, right? Uh, they didn't have technology, but they had more time and more attention and we will, Michael will be talking about how attention plays in, with the whole thing. So they, they are paying attention to what the patient says and how they act. And what they notice, they said that is for the patient. So they had the three principles uh, that of using your imagination. So the first principle is that when you hear about your illness, it is that you think of your illness is that you can get well from this illness, that you can heal from that illness. So, and, and Hippocrates is very specific. Think of your illness or imagine your illness as curable. Um, that was the, the very specific recommendation by Hippocrates. And then the second thing, even though now we may laugh at those, those treatments 2,500 years ago, but it was important that you engage in any type of treatment that we think of the treatment as effective and powerful. So think of your treatment as powerful and effective, right? And when we talk treatments, we talk everything that we do for our health. You know, it may be, for some of you, it may be exercise, maybe also social support. It may be prayer for some of you. It may be um, uh, food, healing, uh, herbs or supplements or whatever. Also, it may be uh, uh, um, you know, whatever you do for your health, it's is important in those treatments. And the last thing, imagine your body as capable of healing itself. And then when you are talking about, you know, viral infection or cancer that your body has the capacity and we were showing you, all those mechanisms that our body has to eliminate uh, those things. But at the same time, it is also important that our body has a capacity to heal our emotions, to heal our 
um, relationships. And also the healing of our relationships is also natural. It is to our natural gentleness, kindness, and compassion. That, that is how we define love. Love is a gentleness, compassion, and kindness. So, so these are important principles. And now I would ask Michael to bring some this all into our body because we were talking about breath we we're talking about uh, mind and then let's bring it to our body thank you so yeah i'm going to talk a little bit about body awareness um i think the more awareness we have about what's going on in our bodies the more effectively we can use imagery to impact and heal those systems of our body so there's this concept called interoception and interoception means awareness and regulation of internal states or, or understanding the symptoms and the sensations that arise in our bodies. And for a lot of us, we're pretty disconnected from our bodies, especially with stress, with trauma, either historical trauma, cultural trauma, um, uh, chronic ongoing trauma, we tend to lose that awareness of our body and it leads to challenges for us. Not being fully aware of what's going on in your body means that you're kind of isolating an entire part of who you are that you could be using to improve your healing. And so there are techniques, and we're going to go through an exercise here in a moment, um, in which we can work to increase our interoceptive abilities. Again, looking at research, um, there's a lot of research coming out on interoception these days, show that with increased capacity to recognize and communicate what's going on with our body, well, it increases our stress resilience, makes us better able to handle stress as it comes up, the more we're aware of what's going on. It helps us with our affective arousal. For example, panic attacks. Panic attacks usually start with someone having a physical sensation that then our beliefs start to blow up around and it leads to a panic attack. So, geez, I'm having a little bit of pain in my chest right here. Oh my God, I must be having a heart attack. I can't breathe anymore. Oh, geez, there's pain shooting down my arm. Oh my, that's kind of how a panic attack goes. So having an awareness that, oh yeah, I've got a little, you know, pain in my chest. I was working a lot in the yard yesterday. I might have pulled something. Um, that's kind of what it feels like. So it helps us manage our arousal around that. It increases our sense of ownership of our bodies and control of our bodies, less self-judgment, more self-acceptance, because we really understand who we are inside. And Mariusha is going to talk in a little while about unconditioned awareness. And that's what mindfulness to the body is. That's what uh, in, uh, working on your interoception, it helps you become more unconditionally aware of what's going on, which increases our immune response, preventing us from from getting sick. So there's a lot of benefits, um, especially as we're so focused in our heads oftentimes to slowing down and reconnecting with our bodies. So I want to do another little exercise. So I'll invite you to, to do the same thing um, you did last time or something different, whatever works for you. So if you want to find a comfortable place, um, if you want to lay down a little bit, sink back, invite you again to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing that. So we're on Zoom, so if everyone closed their eyes, nobody knows who has their eyes open or not. So just take a moment again, return to your breathing. And I'm gonna take a few minutes to take you through a little imagery exercise. So this is a body scan technique that we use to train the mind to be aware rather than diving into a story. So often we feel something and we create a story around that. What's happening? Oh, my cancer is spread. So, no, we just want you to be aware of what's going on in your body. So take a moment, breathe, get in touch with the sensations of your body. And when you're ready, bring your awareness to the physical sensations in your body, especially to the sensations of touch or pressure where your body's making contact with your chair or your couch, wherever you are. Notice those areas of contact. With each exhalation, allow yourself to let go a little bit, relax a little more fully. 
remind yourself of the intention of this practice. Its aim is not to feel any different or to relax or to feel calm. This may happen or it may not. The intention of the practice is as best you can to bring awareness to any sensations that you detect as you focus your attention on each part of the body in turn. So to begin, bring your awareness to the physical sensation in your lower abdomen. Become aware of the changing patterns of sensation in your abdominal wall as you breathe in and as you breathe out. From there, bring your focus on your awareness down the left leg into the left foot. Just you're moving your awareness into the left foot and out to the toes of the left foot. Focus on each of the toes of the left foot in turn, small toe, ring toe, middle toe, big toe bringing a gentle curiosity to the quality of those sensations you find. Perhaps notice a sensation of contact between the toes, a sense of tingling, warmth, or no particular sensation at all. Now allow that awareness to move from the toes into the rest of the foot, to the left ankle, top of the foot, into the bones and joints. And taking a slightly deeper breath, direct your awareness down into the whole of the left foot. And as the breath lets go, let go of the left foot completely, allowing the focus of your awareness to move into your lower left leg. Become aware of the left calf and shin, the knee, front of the thigh, back of the thigh, into the left buttock and hip. Relax the whole left lower body. Now your mind will inevitably wander away from the breath and the body from time to time. That's entirely normal. That's what minds do. Just when you notice it, gently acknowledge it, noticing where the mind has gone off to, and then invite your attention to the part of the body you intended to focus on. So now bring the focus of your awareness down the right leg into the left, right foot and out to the toes of the right foot. Focus on each of the toes of the right foot in turn, bringing a gentle curiosity, the quality of the sensations you find, perhaps noticing a sense of contact between the toes, sense of tingling, warmth, or no particular sensation at all. Now allow the awareness to Expand into the rest of the foot, into the ankle, into the top of the foot, the bones, the joints, taking a slightly deeper breath down into the whole of your right foot. And as that breath lets go, let go of the right foot completely, allowing your awareness to move into the lower right leg. Become aware of the right calf and the shin, the knee, front of the thigh, back of the thigh, into the right buttock and hip. And now relax the whole right lower body. Just notice what that feels like. Now I invite you to bring the focus of your awareness down the left arm, into the left hand, out to the fingers of the left hand. Focus on each of those fingers, pinky, ring, middle, pointer, thumb, Now let that awareness expand the rest of the hand and the arm to the wrist, top of the arm, forearm, upper arm, shoulder. Take your awareness deep into the bones and joints of that arm. Move your awareness to expand across the chest, along the collarbones into the right arm, down the right arm into the right hand, out to the fingers of the right hand, pinky, ring, middle, pointer, thumb. 
Now bring your awareness into the rest of the hand and arm, to the wrist, top of the arm, forearm, upper arm, shoulder. Take your awareness into the bones and joints. Now just take a moment after you've scanned your whole body in this way, spend a few minutes being aware of the sense of your body as a whole and of the breath flowing freely in and out of your body. Just take a moment and notice. And as you're ready, you can slowly start to open your eyes, come back into the moment, take a deep breath in, and a deep breath out. AJ, I don't know if there's a way for you to throw that third pole up there again, just to get a quick measurement. So AJ is going to put up the pole that we did after the breathing. We were already pretty low there, but I'd like you to just rate from one to 10 where you're feeling right now. And then if anybody wants to put anything in the chat, what that feels like, I'd like to see it. So Janie feels like a rag doll, connected, awareness, and relaxed. Feels great, super relaxing. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was not necessarily about relaxing, although that's often a good side effect. It was about when's the last time you thought about your left pinky when it wasn't hurting or something? When's the last time you thought about your collarbones? Oh, uh so yeah, definitely, that helps people feel a lot less tense. So connecting to our bodies is critical. So our breath, our beliefs, and our bodies, if we can stay connected to those things, we can really manage most of our stress. We can get to the point where truly other things, other people don't make us feel any certain way. We have utter control of how we want to feel in any moment. So with that, Thank you for participating. I hope that worked out. And those are tools that you can use for yourself. And if you want, I could share that body scan with, with AJ and you could even record that for yourself. Or maybe you could pull the recording out of this video and have it for yourself as Catherine is suggesting. So Perfect. thank you. AJ, has, thank you, Michael. It is great. And, and so we will be bringing together things that we were talking about from the very first webinar. As those of you may remember that, that we are talking about 10 skills of, uh, 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 of dealing with 10 emotional skills of dealing with any adversity, right? And so, uh, and one skill was appreciation. And here I would like you to to really do this with appreciation for your body. You see, and Michael said, How, when was the last time you thought of your left pinky uh, doing anything? Uh, when it was not hurting, we usually don't pay attention to our bodies. We tell our bodies to do things. To, I very often tell my body to stay up late and finish up on some urgent thing that I want to do. And, and so we are forcing our bodies to do what we want, but we are not listening to our bodies. So here is the time for us appreciating our bodies and really not just connecting, but, but connecting, not, being aware of how much our bodies do for us, being appreciative of all the things that we know that our bodies do, all the things that we are aware that our bodies do, and so many other things that our bodies keep on doing that are so beautiful and healing and, and, and you know, making things that they, uh, making sure that everything works for us. So, 
So here, and I will ask AJ to bring it together too, maybe as a seven points, because I wanted to make the seven points of, of, of uh, doing this imagery in connection with our body and our breath. So, so first principle that we, and we covered them here, so, so this is not a surprise, I'm just bringing all those things together today. Um, so first, you're an expert already. Yeah, you've been using your imagination your own way, so keep on using your imagination on your own way. You're an expert in noticing your own breath. So, so using your breath in your own way, but also playing with it and extending, as Michael uh, said, your, your exhalation helps your body turn on the parasympathetic nervous system and actually turns off the production of adrenaline, one of the stress hormones. So extending your breathing out. This is at the end of breathing out. And you, you might, some of you might have noticed that first time when you are breathing out, Michael was counting to six, then to seven, then eight, and then nine, right? So we were really extending that breath. Um, so, so you are experts already on that. And your body is also an expert. Your body knows. Um, so giving space for your body to heal and time to, to recover. Rule number two, and it is taken from ancient Greeks, it is really a help. And, and the ancient Greeks were saying, oh, imagine your uh, uh, illness is curable. I like to think about it more of having hope that what I, and, you should, and the, the, our second webinar was on hope, which is the crucial skill, but was not included in 10 skills that we covered in the first webinar. So hope is defined as a belief that what I desire I can achieve or what I desire is achievable. So that means that, that it does not only plays out in, in health and healing, but maybe in relationships, and maybe with, with our emotional, mental health, whatever we, we apply ourselves. So imagining that I can achieve it. Right, even though I may not see the avenue for it, but I can achieve it. And as you remember, this I can achieve. It's not that I will achieve, which would be positive thinking. We're teaching healthy thinking. And what I can achieve, it is also the definition has non-attachment to the effect, non-attachment to the outcome. So we we see, oh yes, I will put my best effort, but I I don't control the outcome, but I will do my best. So that is number two. This is the hopeful part of, of use of imagination and connecting with our body and breath. Number three, we are talking about the Asian Greeks, we're talking about this, imagine your treatments as powerful and effective as being your friends and allies. Many of my cancer patients often tell me, oh, how can I think about my chemotherapy as being my friend or my radiation therapy as being my friend? Actually, you can because you are better off with this treatment than without it. And yes, sometimes your friends don't behave the way you like them to behave, right? Well, you yourself sometimes may not behave the way you want to behave. Sometimes after a big party, you have to clean up after your friends. So, so but you are better off with your friends than without them. So, so thinking of them being powerful, effective as your friends and allies. And number Four, uh, rule number four is imagine if your body is capable of healing itself, if, if it's having that wisdom that has been in it all the time and has been ex expressing itself in keeping you relatively healthy most of the time, even though you might, might have treated your body not always wonderfully. So, so. Um, oh, let me come back a little bit to the third one. When you are talking treatments, it's not just the, the chemical treatments, but anything that I do for my health, like participating in these webinars. Uh, for me, it is very healing to look at your faces. Actually, I really, it, it is energizing for me to see participants who are in the panel and, and seeing the numbers of participants staying <laughs> that long with us. Um, 
that is, and though I appreciate you in that for that, and I appreciate my body too, and my mind uh, for that. So, and the number coming back to number four, that's body as capable of feeling itself and connecting to our body, being aware and appreciative of our body. And number five is keeping enthusiasm in it. So I need to be enthusiastic in it. A lot of people undermine their their exercise and imagery by saying, oh, am I lying to myself? Am I faking it? Or No. The same way when you are learning to speak a new language or learning to play an, an instrument. You are not faking that you know how to play. You are not faking that you know how to speak in that language. You are practicing. The thing is that a lot of people particularly in America, they like to have guarantee of success before they try. So they, they don't speak foreign languages before, oh, I have to first learn the language well <laughs> to speak it. No, you will never like it. learn a foreign language well before you, you start speaking it, you know? So, so you need to speak it. And if you don't speak it, you will lose it, you know? Uh, you know so I, I used to speak more foreign languages than I do now after living in America for such a long time. And so, so the, yes, so that is the six, and it ties with this now, uh, principle number six. It is that you need to practice. The more you practice, the more effective you are going to become. And and the seventh is not being under that when you are deepening that connection with your body and your healing. You, your understanding deepens, but you suspend your judgment. And the suspending of your judgment is what brings us to what Michael announced, um, to unconditioned awareness. You know, that is the awareness, uh, and that is the natural state of our bodies, and we were um, referring to it uh, before. It is the state of our body or our mind and, uh, and our breath. And when we are babies, right? When the baby wakes up from its wonderful nap, it gets the favorite food, it gets the clean diaper, it gets all the hugs and kisses, uh, and all the love from their parents. And the baby, what is the state of mind of this baby? It's content, right? The baby is not waiting for anything. This is simply X, re, re, uh, relax. Oh, number six, some people are asking, what was the number six? Number six was practice, 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 practice. The more you practice, and like Michael was saying, our mind tastes, uh, tends to wander, but you will notice that, that the more you practice this relaxation and breathing and so on, you are going to get better at it. And the same with unconditioned awareness, the part of the suspending your judgment. But the baby is non-judgmental, right? But the baby has no plans, no agenda. It is simply content with what is. And this being content with what is, it is what we call unconditional radical acceptance. So accepting whatever is arising within my body and the sensations. Like Michael said, that when we start over-interpreting whatever is happening in our body, it may lead to a panic. Oh, I, and then, I mean, oh, my, my, we can have six additional heartbeats a minute and it's normal. And then suddenly, well, but we start un interpreting it in a way that scares us. We, we go into this vicious circle. Oh, this, I got scared. So, of course, now when I get scared, my heart starts racing. And so, and then, oh, I get scared of that. And that is this vicious circle of panic. But no, just connecting with your body non judgmentally and, and radically accepting whatever is arising and really with appreciation, radically accepting whatever is arising to you emotionally. Any emotions or thoughts or distracting ideas that show up in your mind, that is radically accepting without judgment. Uh, and without also our habitual, I like it, I don't like it. And then moving towards, uh, so. So yes, yeah, so, so radically accepting, also if there are any noises from the outside, accepting them too, or anything else, malfunctioning of oh, the technology or whatever, but accepting that. Doesn't mean acceptance, doesn't mean that I won't try to fix it when I have the chance to do it, but right now, I radically accept the way it is. And also, 
accepting others the way they are. You know, we would like people to be exactly the way we are. No, we can only change our part of the relationship. We cannot change them. And then what we were talking about is unconditioned acceptance of the future. So really, be unconditionally accepting of the future, which is non-attachment. Yes, we can plan, we can do our best, we can give it the best shot, but we don't control. The saying goes, if you want to make God laugh, tell them your plans. <laughs> so, yeah. That doesn't mean that we don't want to put our best efforts. Oh, you are waiting for something? Hmm. Sorry, no waiting. That is part of our unconditioned awareness, just resting. There's nothing to wait for. No agenda, no ambition. Just sitting or laying down or whatever position you're in. Some people start their meditations, oh, please assume as comfortable position as possible. Oh, why weren't you comfortable before? We encourage you to be as comfortable as possible anytime. Just resting. And you know, just, you may want to decrease the distractions by, you know, closing your eyes. So, if it feels right for you. And just resting, suspending all the judgments, suspending habitual, I like it, I don't like it. Oh, and reminding yourself that you are a human being. And just being is enough. There's nothing that you need to prove. <laughs> You're a valuable human being just by being. And for this moment, there is nothing that you have to do. There is nothing that you have to understand more than you already do. This moment is it. This is it right now. There is nothing beyond it right now. And this it right now is pretty good. So radically accepting whatever is arising in this moment. Nothing can be added to this moment, nothing can be taken away from it. You are it in this moment. You cannot be any better than you are. <laughs> you are fine just the way you are for this moment. So radically accepting this moment the way it is and yourself the way you are for this moment is actually the ultimate healing. It doesn't get better than that. This is it. You are there. There is nowhere else to arrive. We're often seeking beyond what is, is the source of suffering. So we can dissolve the suffering by staying in the space of unconditioned awareness. Where all the disturbing thoughts or constricting emotions dissolve themselves as snowflakes falling on a warm board. And notice your breath. Just notice your breath and breathe the way it feels most comfortable to you right now. 
again with knowledge and the non machine. Just be. And imagine how your body and your mind and your breath are working in harmony to bring most healing for you in this moment. How your body and mind are the most healing right now. It's happening by itself without any conscious effort on your part. So the same way that you cannot force yourself to relax You just can drop in there, allowing yourself. The same way you cannot force yourself to be in unconditioned awareness. It is in you, the space is in you. Just allow yourself to drop there. And resting there. And that is you're an expert in inducing healing in your body, and you've been doing so all your life. And you can achieve what you believe that you desire. You can achieve what you believe that you can achieve. It doesn't say when, it doesn't say how. But put your best effort right now in coming days, to moving in the direction that you want to achieve, but without attachment. And whatever you do for your health, whatever you do for your goals, whatever you do, imagine that all the allies in you and around you, helping you to get there and your body and your mind is capable of getting there and your relationship is helping you and do it with enthusiasm and appreciation that you are wired that way and appreciation that your body has all those known and unknown mechanisms of keeping you healthy and healing. And see yourself practicing these new ways. And practicing unconditioned awareness, practicing your breath, and being aware of what your imagination is doing and being aware of your, what your body is doing. And your understanding is going to expand. Your, expand. your understanding of your relationship with yourself and those around you. And your acceptance, unconditional, profound, radical acceptance of what is in you and around you is going to become more profound. And next week, we are going to be talking about modifying lifestyle, but without deprivation, as effortless as possible, so effortless as now. And very gently and comfortably, you return to your usual state of awareness, becoming more aware of the lights, the sounds and the presence of other people. And as soon as you are ready, just go ahead and open your eyes. So, thank you very much everyone.
It is such a joy to share with you all that wisdom that I got from my mentors, and the wisdom of my co-workers, Michael, Alexandra, and Andrew, and also the wisdom that you bring it to, how you open yourself to it, and that is the reason that we can have such wonderful results in the polls. <laughs> so thank you very much. And next week we are going to have really excellent expert in the in the lifestyle modification, but without the usual connection of deprivation and hard work <laughs> and sweat, she is going to show us uh, how to make it uh, easy <laughs> and doable and connect to our current lifestyle. Uh, and how to do it gently with ourselves, because very often we try to impose the new rules on ourselves against our bodies and against our habits. Now it is going to be combining all that. So thank you very much, and it is very, very rewarding for us. So share your, your ideas. We are going to hang back for another uh, few minutes. Uh, so we are going to unmute all the panelists. So you want to put your comments in the uh, in the chat section feel free so thank you very much thank you there is actually one question from a lady mm -hmm. and the question says uh, in the last years a number of people having cancer increased is it because different new types of cancer developed or is it because we lost our ability of self-healing so uh, the, some of the part of, of increasing cancer incidence is because our lives uh, are longer. So with age, we tend to have more cancers. Um, also, the other part is that more and more uh, world is living uh, in a Western lifestyle with all its unhealthy lifestyle. So there's more obey obesity and that is one of the reasons we have lifestyle issues uh, addressed next webinar next week uh, so so yes because more and more people have sedentary lifestyle more and more people have uh, uh, you know eat unhealthy you know refined products meat uh, uh, and sugars and so on so that, uh, but at the same time, more and more people are cured from cancer. That is very important. That that mortality from cancer decreases. So so yes, there is more incidence of cancer, but less death of cancer. And there is another part. The longer we live, the, the more people uh, we know who can develop cancer. <laughs> and, and that is a bias uh, that we automatically assume, oh, wow, I've, I've seen more cancers now than I've seen before. Because also people that we know also age with us. So, so there is an idea, oh, wow, there's more cancer than it was when I was a child. Yeah, there's, you can see there is now. In the United States, we have about 60,000 children diagnosed a year uh, with cancer. Uh, 60,000. But we have two and a half million children living with a parent who has cancer. So cancer affects children much more through a parent being sick of cancer than attaching them. But, so, yeah. These are the facts. Sometimes not what you expect. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for the videos and all the facts and the relaxing imagery. So, uh, it was yeah, wonderful. so I'm going to send the, the, the link to those videos and, and comments and some uh, scientific references now to all attendees. i just send it to you so, so you can watch and read about it as much as you can share it with anybody else you know and uh, oh that is not the webinars it is i sent you the, the link to webinars sorry oh you can share that link too uh, we update that that that, that page um, uh, every mm, thursday 
So meanwhile, let me say that and all of the recordings the are going to be available and we're going to follow up with an email to every attendee and panelist. So uh, we get tons of email asking if, if you're going to get materials, if we're going to get recordings. The answer is yes. And, and the thanks usual to AJ. around uh, Wednesday or Thursday. So, yeah. so thank you for AJ. It is his work and Mateusz and we hopefully we'll be able to have at least a short message from Mateusz next time uh, sure. because he is he is doing a lot of silent work like our immune system uh, to make sure that everything gets to you on time and so on so thank you and let me also put in the link to our Facebook group where we post uh, meditations uh, that are being done when we post extra content uh, and uh, we found it the easiest way to connect after this webinar. So, and is, is Ola still here? Ola is doing a wonderful job uh, running these groups, helping us running these groups. She's, uh, thank you, Ola, once again. You're Ola welcome. is Alexandra, I always yes. forget. <laughs> Alexandra is uh, Ola in English. And uh, I pasted the, the link. So, if you want to join this group, uh, we'll be in touch. And also, Mariusz is posting some great stuff here, there too. Sometimes. If we, if we poke him. It takes a scientific village. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you very much. We appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you,